Nature elegantly converts the sun's energy from one form to another. These energy transformations happen around us every day in our cities, homes, and cars. But unlike in nature, we need to convert solar power with an inverter. These inverters turn solar energy into home electricity, convert power into hot water, cool and heat up our homes and buildings with HVAC systems, store solar energy in a battery to use in the evening, and even charge our electric cars. Inverters are turning our homes and businesses into smart energy ecosystems. One smart inverter can manage all of the home's energy needs. But inverters do more than just managing our home's energy. They convert and manage energy in our electric vehicles, office buildings, factories, data centers, and more. Since these inverters are all around us, they can work together in a network to smartly manage energy. They transform our PV systems, batteries, and other appliances into energy resources for the grid, turning each of us into active energy participants and producers. This will revolutionize the grid into a decentralized energy network and power our world based on a new clean energy economy. By improving the way we use and consume energy, Solar Edge is powering a better future for us all. Here we are. We're live from Solar Tide. Welcome everybody to today's designer session. Um, we're joined here with myself and Chris Laver as normal. Uh, we can't hear you and we can't see you. So I've just written in there straight away for the chat box. Um, that's where you can ask some questions and you should be able to hear me. If you aren't, then check your audio. Really, really nice video there. One of my favorite videos from Solar Edge and it just, I don't know, maybe I'm sad, but it just fills me with goosebumps because every single time I think about this, we are the energy transition. That's where we're going in this market. All of you, us, Solar Edge, every inverter manufacturer, every module manufacturer, we're making the change to the world. Um, and what's going to be coming over the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years is going to be very, very exciting. Um, it's not just about generating power. If you look at the way the market's going, we're, we're, we're changing our energy transition to electric cars, heat pumps, insulation. We are actually making our houses more efficient and everything's moving towards electricity. So it's, it's, it's really, really something that I'm very keen and passionate about. So I hope that you realize that you're actually part of that as well. So anyway, just some personal stuff there. Wonderful, well done, Rich. <clears throat> so welcome to today's level three advanced installer training. Uh, myself, my name is Richard Fuel. I'm the UK and Irish sales manager. My email address is there, should you want to contact me. Um, ask any questions, anything like that. And once again, we are joined by the wizard himself, Chris Laver, who is our commercial project manager, um, an expert in the designer, has to be said. So it's, it's, it's yeah, we're, we're, we're really pleased to have Chris on our team for the level of knowledge and experience that he's got. So um, today, as we're, we're going through the session, so this is level three, this is the advanced session. Thank you for joining once again. If you've not been with us uh, for the last two sessions of the basic and intermediate, you've missed out um this this now just goes it's not it's not that advanced but it's just showing you more features and benefits within the session as well um we're going to be going over lots of different features today uh shading impacts um inverter selection half hourly data some obstacles uh, different roof split feature it's it's a really really good session today as well so please just ignore your phones ignore your emails like i always say for the next hour um, we're going to go through quite a bit today, so there may be some things in there that you may miss if you just lose your attention for two minutes. Um, just points to note, as I normally do, you need to be using Google Chrome. If you're using Internet Explorer or Firefox, you may have issues um, and some of the features won't be available to you. Um, need to use a mouse, obviously, and to focus on your angles. 
so just going to flip over straight away uh, into the Solar Edge website. Just going to highlight it once again because you're going to find out very, very soon when you want to install the Solar Edge Energy Bank. How can you install the Solar Edge Energy Bank? You have to carry out the Solar Edge Energy Bank training. To do this, you go to login, you come to Edge Academy, you sign in with your normal credentials, the same ones you're using for designer, the same ones you're using for the monitoring or for setup, anything like that. That's where the battery training is in the Edge Academy. Okay. Um, and that's that's that. So I'm just going to come straight into designer straight away. Uh, and I, actually, I've already loaded this one up. So this this one here is uh, just a, a quite an interesting um, situation, which I'm going to go with you today. And this is this is about oversizing. So there's my property just there, which I've already created. And I can come in here to the PV modules. And as you can see, just move this out of the way. Uh, as you can see, just down here, click on my roof and I've got 12 panels. OK, so I've got 12 of my modules and I've got a 4.2 kilowatt system. OK, so that's really nice. 12 panels right there straight away. Come into my electrical design. And as I've got here with my electrical design, I've got my 12 panels there in, in, a, in my circuit with my power optimizers and I've moved my inverter. So when I then export this to monitoring, once the customer's going ahead, my inverter is there on the layout and it's nice and close to my panels. Uh, if you leave it up here, when you then do the actual monitoring on the site, you'll actually see the inverter and the modules are quite far away. So I'd always advise you just to bring, you can put it there if you want, you can put it wherever you want, okay? But just bring it close to the actual, um, uh, close to the panels, okay? Then I come into the summary page. And in the summary page, you can see I've got this one named as 12 modules, okay? The advanced installer, blah, blah, blah. That's all great, wonderful. Uh, and I've got my images of the different properties on there. And all I'm going to do is just scroll down. Uh, and we can see here I've got a 4.2 kilowatt system installed with 3.68 inverter. And my annual generation is roughly five megawatt hours per year. And that's all great. Wonderful. I put my uh, consumption data in there as well, which, as you can see, is six megawatt hours. This is what the customer is using. And their generation data and their export data. Um, is dependent on the profile that we actually chose in the first place. So for any of you that are thinking, whoa, how have you done this? How have you got there? We've covered these in the beginners in the intermediate session. So if you've not seen those, uh, then you can request, um, please via email um, rather than on the text because I won't get back to you otherwise. So that's that. Um, great. So what I want to do is on this stage here, I'm just going to come back to the PV modules. <coughs> And as I said, I've got 12 panels here and I've got 4.2 kilowatts uh, installed. Now, historically in the UK, for those of you that have been in the industry for some time, we used to have a feed-in tariff. Now, the feed-in tariff was actually staged that you would install up to four kilowatts and you got a certain amount of payment. Between four kilowatts and 10 kilowatts, you got a lower rate of payment. Then the rules changed a few years later and then it was zero to 10 kilowatts and that's what you got paid. The amount of people I speak to now that are actually installing larger PV systems compared to those people that are still installing a four kilowatt peak system. And I, I just don't understand why people are still installing a four kilowatt peak system, because that's what I'm allowed. No, you're allowed a 3.68 kilowatt inverter under G98. So this is where I'm going to talk about oversizing. OK, now we're here. We've got uh, 12 panels. What I'm going to do, just to give you a nice uh, overview of what this looks like, if I come up to the top here on my file and I've got 12 modules, I'm just going to click on these three dots and I'm just going to duplicate this design exactly the same. And then just going to rename it for ease. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go on here and I'm going to go 16 panels, enter. So I've got exactly the same, everything about them is identical, just the name that's different. On this one here, I'm actually just going to extend this over and I'm going to put an extra four panels on here. So now you can see I've actually got 16 modules. I've got a total, total capacity of 5.6 kilowatts. Now with Solar Edge single phase inverters, we can oversize our inverter by 155%. So that essentially means I can put more DC power onto the roof connected into my inverter. So why would you do that? There's quite a few number of reasons. But I'm just going to show you one of those reasons right now. Because I've changed this, I'm now going to go to electrical design. And as I've added those four panels on there, I now simply need to actually add uh, the, the string for these optimizers in here as well. So what I do is I click on this string. I'm up here to my string. 
Now let's just come to number six. I click on number six, hold down my left button, and I just move my mouse forwards. And you can see now I've actually added those additional four panels into my string circuit. And you can see that my oversizing is 152%, and I'm still using a 3.68 inverter. So in this situation, everybody wins. You win because you're installing more solar panels. Your end customer wins because they're going to be generating more power. How much more power are they going to be generating? So if we come down to the summary page, you can see there I've got my, I've got my modules on the roof. As I scroll down, right here, I've got 5.6 kilowatts installed, a 3.68 inverter, and 6.43 megawatt hours I'm going to generate. If I come back to 12 modules, you can see the difference there. Same inverter. All you've done is installed more panels into that system. Okay. Now, when it comes to oversizing, a lot of people are saying, well, there's going to be some clipping or, you know, why would you oversize? Why would you not put a four kilowatt system into a 3.68? Because anything additional than that is going to be wasted. True. It will be wasted. When will it be wasted is my question. And the way that I would answer this to any customer or to you as installers or designers is, when are you going to be wasting that power in a year? So there's 12 months in a year. How many of those 12 months do we have really nice, hot, sunny, shiny days where the power is actually going to be clipping that power? For me personally, I live in Devon. We have a lot of sunny weather down here. And I would say as an average, we probably, if I'm going right out there, maybe 100 sunny days in a year. That's 265 days of the year. It's not sunny. So we may have cloudy conditions. We may have a day like today where it's winter and it's cloudy. But I'm going to be generating more power if I've got more solar panels in that system. The bottleneck is right here, this 3.68 kilowatt inverter. Now, on one of those nice sunny days, we're going to have something called clipping. And clipping is essentially when I'm generating five kilowatts worth of power, it comes down to my inverter. I've only then got 3.68 kilowatts of AC power, but I've got more potential of that actual power coming from the solar panels themselves. So if you're looking at an east-west system, for example, and you're installing a, a four kilowatt peak system, you'd have two kilowatts on the east and two kilowatts on the west. That system in reality, in my opinion, won't actually generate more than say 2.8 to 3.2 kilowatts worth of power. If I actually put three kilowatts on the east and three kilowatts on the west, I've now got a six kilowatt system. And my going into a 3.68 kilowatt inverter, I'm actually now gonna be maximizing that potential that I've got at my inverter. Now, in standard test conditions, we can oversize the inverter by 55%, 155%. So a nice calculation, 3.68 plus 55% equals 5.7 kilowatts. But what it's actually doing in designer is giving you the actual design, the actual DC calculation. So as I've said there, you've got six kilowatts. If it generates more than 5.7, it won't allow you to do it. But what it will do, it will allow you to generate as much as you can on that roof. Because I've got that all facing the same way in this design, that's why it's given me a, an output of 152%. So when would you oversize? So me personally, I'm looking at the future. I'm thinking about electric cars. I'm thinking about heat pumps. I'm thinking about the whole transition with battery storage and charging on from the grid and putting power onto the grid and all those different things. For you to maximize your customer's benefits by having a solar PV system, I would install as many solar panels as you can on that system. On commercial, it's a different story because it depends again on the DNO. If you're installing a 50 kilowatt peak system, you would be going into a 50 kilowatt inverter. If your restriction is a 50 kilowatt inverter, you can actually oversize that inverter by 50%. You can therefore now have 75 kilowatts worth of power going into that 50 kilowatt inverter. Designer will show you all of this. It will allow you what you can do and what you can't do in the electrical design. Now in the electrical design itself, so what I've got here, if I just delete this inverter, just to show you how you can do this, so here it's on three phase. So I'm just going to select a single phase. And what you can see here, it's suggesting a four kilowatt inverter for our 4.2 kilowatt system. Just here, if I move my dial up at the top, you can see now my inverter's changed to a 3.68 kilowatt inverter. If I move my dial up a little bit further, you can now see it's changed to a 3.5. If I go a little bit further than that, I can now actually use a three kilowatt inverter in this. 
I would not use a three kilowatt inverter in this situation. Why? Because I don't need to. My bottleneck is the 3.68. So for me personally, I would always be looking to oversize a system for a 3.68 kilowatt inverter because that is my limit. If I have grid approval to actually install a five kilowatt inverter, same again, increase the size of the DC. If I have an export limitation situation where they actually have to limit the export down to 3.68, I can install the, uh, the Solar Edge uh, energy bank. And then from that, I can limit then the export down to 3.68 if I have approval from the DNO before I make that installation. Okay. So that's essentially what this oversizing thing is at the top. When you do a new project, it will actually be set, I believe, at 120% right there. Okay. So that's, that's the oversizing. Uh, I'm sure there's loads of questions. I can see the thing jumping up and down, but Chris is there answering those ones, and I will come out and read some of those if, uh, if, if they need to. Okay. Now, just to come on to another one uh, before I pass over to Chris. So here, you may remember last week we did this lovely, uh, this lovely design here, nice commercial design. And what I've done actually, I've put on the east facing, the west facing, and the south facing roof as well. Okay. If I come down to my electrical design. My electrical design is all complete. Come down to my summary page. And my summary page is showing me my, my system and it's got my generation and everything's great in there as well. Okay. Now, what I want to do is actually upload some consumption profile into this as well. So if I come on to project info, scroll down slightly. And here on the left hand side, we've got the choice here of commercial or residential. So I'm going to go for commercial. And here, if I know the consumption, I can type in 50,000 kilowatt hours. I can choose a consumption profile. Let's say they're weekday focused. Just press choose. And now I can actually show that in there as well. Okay. If I've got half hourly data from this client, I need a whole 12 months of half hourly data. I can actually upload this right here. So I simply click on the half hourly data and then put that into the system as well. Now, how do you do that? So let's just imagine. This ear, sorry, this ear, <laughs> this here is my half hourly data that I've actually obtained from the client. Okay, so we can see here on the left hand side, I've got the first of the first, the second of the first, the third, the fourth, all the way down. If I come right the way down to the bottom, we've got the 31st of December. Okay, so you can see there, I've actually got 365 days of the year. Okay, and then from this as well, I've got midnight to 12.30, uh, 12.30 to one o'clock, 1.30, all the way through. And if I come to the end, I can see I've got a 24 hour period there. Okay, so this is the half hourly data that I've got from my client, from their energy supplier. If you get the data um, where it's actually split or it comes from June through to the end of May, you just need to change it. So it has to be in the first, uh, all the way down to the 31st. Okay, nice and simple. So this is the half hourly data that I've got. Now, what we also have, we have a matrix and you will be sent this uh, immediately after this presentation today. So for all of you commercial people, this is something that you're gonna love. So basically the matrix here is uh, three tabs at the bottom. So we've got the instructions, which is what we're on now, an insert matrix, half hourly data into the tab, input data. Ensure the data is short, sorted chronologically from the 1st to the 31st. So I've said that bit there. Make sure it's sorted from 1st of January through to the 31st of December. So what we need to do is insert into the input tab. So if I come down to the input tab, and essentially I've got exactly the same thing that I was just showing you. So what I do is I go back to my data. I click on the first date, press shift, and I'm highlighting these points. Press control and down. And now I've highlighted all the way through to December and then still holding shift and control to the right. And I've highlighted all of those points. I then simply press control, copy. So I've now copied that data, it's in my clipboard. Flip back over to the matrix, click on the first cell and press control V. I've pasted that data now. And you can see in there, we've actually got some, uh, some nice colors to show how much power they're using. The darker the color, the more power they're actually using. So these guys are obviously using a bit of power between half past eight through to nine o'clock, and then actually finishing all the way through, but dropping off around here at say seven o'clock. Okay, so we've got a nice one. And as well here, you can see at the weekends, they're not using as much power. So it's obviously something they're using during the week. Okay, let's go back to the instructions. Go to output data, go file, save a copy, set appropriate name, select CSV, save, okay? You will get a recording of this webinar as well, just in case it's all confusing. So we go down to output data, 
and it's all highlighted already. Okay, so what I want to do is just click here above the one and it highlights that whole section. Again, press Control C for copy. And then what I'm going to do is just do a new blank Word document, press Control V to paste it. And now what it's done is actually put all of that data in one long line the whole way down, all the way through. So you can see I'm still in January, all the way down through. If I come down to the very bottom, I come down to the very bottom. You can see I'm there at the 31st of December, 2019 and uh, at 11 o'clock. So now what I do is I come to the very top. And now I just wanna go to file and now I'm gonna go save as. And then what I'm gonna do is just save it into somewhere into my computer. So I'm just gonna call this here, designer half hourly. And now on the instructions as well, I know this, but it does tell you, you just need to save this as a CSV. So just here on the drop down, it's going to save it as an Excel workbook. Just change it here to save as CSV. Click on save as CSV, press save. That's it, it's done. Okay. Now we just go back to our designer and then we simply click on the upload half hourly data. And then from this, we have to find the file, which I think is in here, designer session. There it is, designer half hourly data, press open. And you can see now it's input that data for the whole 12 months in there of 77,841, and it's an uploaded profile. So the uploaded profile knows exactly when you're generating or when you're using the power in that 12 month period. A couple of things to note. If it's a, if it's a leap year, you have to remove the 29th of no, uh, February. Okay, so just remove that whole day completely. It has to work on 365 days of the year. Now, if you've forgotten everything that I've said, this is gonna be sent to you in a recording. You'll get that half hourly uh, matrix as well. And just down here as well in the question mark, what I've got here in the question mark uh, is I've got an application note and in here somewhere, it says interval consumption data file uh, upload to designer. So that's basically just a, an application note to show you exactly how to do that. Okay, that's good. Um, oh, and then the finally, once you've put that in there, you have to click apply. Once you've clicked apply, it's in there, come down to the summary page. Come on, baby. So there's our name of the project. That's it, great. There's our system. Scroll down and we can actually see that this 30 kilowatt system is beautiful. So they're, they're actually self-consuming 71%. They're exporting 28%. Their consumption is 77 megawatt hours. So potentially what I would then do with this is duplicate the whole design and put solar panels on the other roofs as well to increase the consumption. That's what I personally would be doing with that system because they're still bringing a lot of power in from the grid. Okay, that's good. Or potentially look at adding batteries in the future, see how the system's working, wait for the free phase battery to come from us, which will come in a few years time. Um, and then from this, you can then simply add that battery to that system as well. So lot, lots of things in there as well very briefly before I pass over to Chris. If I come back to my project page, so right here, that's the design that I just did. <coughs> I've got an issue with it. I can't, um, I can't draw the roof. Um, I, can't, I can't put the half hourly data in it. I can't, Rich, can you help me? Chris, can you help me? We will ask you to share the project with us. Now, sharing a project essentially means over here, this is the project we've just been working on. This is the one right here. As I move my mouse over to the right-hand side, we can see here we've got an icon that says share. You click on share, and then it says here, share with the customer. Just come over here to share with users. Type in the email address. So that's richard.fuel at solaredge.com. And then here, change this to can edit. Now that essentially means once you press this button, we can now see it in our list. It's now shared with us. We can see it in our designer list. If you create a design, we can't see it. Okay, so, but now because you've shared it with us, we can now see it. So now what you do is don't drop me an email and say, Rich, I've just shared a project with you. Great, wonderful. What's it called? Where is it? What's it called? Oh, it's called Dixon, but it's not Dixon. It's 25 Dixon way. What you need to do is just here, go copy project link. So now that's basically gone control paste, uh, control copy. Send me an email, dear Rich, here is the project. Please can you amend the half hourly data or um, add, add the panels or I've got a problem with the system or the roof's not picking up or anything like that. 
paste. So then we can see the project. We then receive an email. There's the link. Click on the link. Takes us straight into that design. Okay. So that's that's something there, Chris. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I've gone five minutes over. Oh, sorry, Richard. That's fine. Um, I hope that wasn't too quick for everybody. Um, thank you very much as well for all of the feedback that we received last week in, in the survey afterwards. Chris is going to cover quite a bit of this today with the shading, shading from different buildings, shading from trees, um, and a few things like that as well, which are going to be coming up. So thanks very much for the feedback. Chris, over to you. I can see your screen and I can hear you. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, we are going to visit uh, four sites, maybe five. I'm going to look at a couple of residential sites, um, a flat roof, and then finish off with a ground mount design. Um, let's jump straight in. Um, the purpose of today um, is to effectively look at different buildings that are connected um, together and how they may model differently within Designer. Um, so let's jump into site modeling here. Um, the image is quite grainy. Um, I have had a look on Earth, um, indeed, at all the sites today, um, but unfortunately, none of them are great imagery, so um, we'll, we'll deal with what we've got. Um, sometimes it is the case, and you can only work with what you've got. Um, so we're going to look at this main roof here, and then this extension, or it could be a garage here, uh, which is clearly A at a different level, so the main building um, could be a different pitch. Um, but all in all, it is a different entity that's connected to the same building. Um, so let's start just by drawing the outline of our building. Again, paying attention, as always, to the angles. We're looking here at the 90 degree indicator. Uh, we're just going to plot the corners and look for the indication from the software there to finish. We're going to put our ridge line in, search for the center designated by the blue dot, and terminate the other end. Um, so that is our main roof. Um, we're now going to draw in the extension connected to the main property. Again, paying attention to the right angles. Okay. Um, then we can add this hip section in here. So I'm going to find the center, just float a line up that's dark green so I know it's parallel with the others, and the software will tell me where to finish. And then we'll just run this ridge line along the top, looking for the line to go dark green there to symbolize that it's parallel with these lines here. And we're going to finish that there. Okay, so that's the building modeled. We can get rid of this line, it was just a guideline. But now, if we jump into 3D and try and extrude any elevation or, or move anything, let's try this ridge, for example, the model doesn't like it. And I've mentioned previously, if you can't pull up a design, it could be that you're trying to pull it up from the wrong line or polygon, but even trying different lines here, achieve nothing. Indeed, the model's not happy, the fact that there's two elements connected to one. So what we can do is flatten that down, jump back into 2D, and then we're looking at the lines that effectively separate the two buildings, if you like. And rather than it being one long line here, you can see because we put this ridge in and this ridge in, it split this into three sections of lines. We have to select each individually. Um, what we can do is click on a line that's highlighted in dark blue. I'm going to use this split feature here. And we can click on each line and split those lines out one by one. Now, when I jump into 3D, we'll see that I can first of all select just this part of the building. You can see there where we split the lines, there are in fact two lines. So now I can manoeuvre this independently. So let's bring that up to five metres. And then we can add our pitch. Let's target 30 degrees. And then we can now pick this section up on its own, raise or lower accordingly. Um, let's say it's halfway up the, the property, so 2.5. Again, by double clicking in this section here, you can enter an accurate elevation height or an accurate pitch height. If I clicked here and change that to 40 degrees, we'll also change that there. And if I swing around the side, you'll see them both change at the same time. 30 degrees. Um, so we've got the correct height for our extension. We can now again 
manipulate this section of the roof independently to the main roof. Um, it could be that it meets a nice parallel. Um, it could be that it's a different pitch, so 40 degrees, but it can be completely independent of the main building. Um, you can then also adjust the height, perhaps this intersection meets the lines of the main roof. So there you can then see that each section of the building is modeled independently. So whereas before I click these lines individually and split them, I can click them individually and unsplit them. It used to be the case, um, and indeed it's still the case, but currently there's a slight issue. Sometimes when you select all the lines, the split feature is not appearing. Um, so that is a known current bug and they are working through that. Um, to get around it um, a little bit quicker, you can highlight multiple lines. So I'm going to click once, hold control, click all the lines that I want to split, and then split them all at the same time. And even here, you can see the single lines turned into two lines, back into 3D. And again, I can model each section independently and indeed their heights. So it comes in very handy, um, certainly not only residentially, commercially as well. Um, to recognize that split feature and where you've got different parts of a building that will act with different parameters, um, could be heights, could be pitch, um, lengths, widths, um, the split feature um, will enable you to model them separately. Um, hopefully I've not labored that point too much. Um, that, that's, but, that's perfect, Chris. A couple of questions that have come in. How did you separate the roofs? Um, you've just shown it again, so that's exactly how you've done it. Drawn around the whole building and then clicked on those lines and just press split. Um, so that's that's good. Hopefully that's answered your question, Neville. Um, oh, yes, you have. Um, another question as well. How do you know the height of the building and the pitch from Google Earth? You don't. This is a satellite image that's come from Google Earth. So we don't know if that's three meters high or 10 meters high. We've got no idea whatsoever. Um, as we've shown before, what you can do is actually go onto Google Earth Street View, for example, by going onto the project info. Um, and then once that loads up, you can then come into the Google Earth Street View and then you can potentially see the height of the property. But um, obviously the pitch of the roof and things like that, it's 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 a 2D image taken from a satellite, so you would have to either um, understand from the site itself what the pitch is from a site survey or from actually um, from the customer themselves. So yeah, you don't, we don't know the pitch like you don't know the pitch. We don't know the height like you don't know the height either. Yeah, typically um, most domestic properties two stories high are 2.5 meters per elevation. So if you've got two elevations, you're looking at five meters high. However, um, that is not the case for every single property ever built. That is just a general rule of thumb. Um, most residential properties, again, 30 up to 45 degrees. But again, um, properties are built in all manner of different ways. So um, it, it's really down to you to gauge from a street view if one is available um, or from pictures of the property. Or if you're visiting, then you can use your inclinometer uh, um, and get the pitch that way. Um, but yeah, we can't tell um, just the same as you can't tell. Um, so it, it's a bit of... Uh, guesstimation, best guess. Um, sometimes there's not even a street view available locally. Um, sometimes you can maybe get a couple of roads behind and, and peer through. Um, but yeah, um, it's best guess really. Um, okay, let's have a look at site two. Uh, similar in nature, um, but there's a little bit more going on. Um, so we're going to look at this property here. Um, let's jump into the modeling. So what we can see straight away is the imagery is skewed. So it's been taken from a southwesterly direction by the satellite, um, which has made the, the image twist slightly. Um, indeed, we can see some of the gable wall section here um, and the chimney. Um, again, I have checked on, on Google Earth today because I was going to look to import some imagery in like we did last week. Um, however, no better imagery is really available. Um, so we'll just work with what we've got. Um, and what we'll see is I'm going to plot a line right across this gable rather than following these diagonals. So if I plot the first point here and come across to the corner and then carry on with the outline of the property, again finishing at the corner, indication from the software to finish, Let's put the ridge line down the center. You'll notice here, it looks like I've missed some roof, but the points, the corners are connected. 
and much the same here it looks like i've incorporated too much of the roof because the gable's in the shot but this is owing to the the um, imagery being skewed okay so that's our main building um let's put the garage in uh, we'll call it a garage for now um, and it's obviously connected to the building um, again don't be fooled by the the skewed imagery um, let's go to the center there can't quite see this line but let's guesstimate here that's pretty good um, and then this terminates into the main building here um, let's put the ridge line in for this you can treat it as a flat roof and leave a ridge line out um, or we can find the center point and go from here so you'll notice i've gone from this side which is the full length or depth if you like of that building which has enabled me to find the center point if i went from this line which is obviously much shorter or indeed the same length over two lines it will only give me the center of that line, which isn't the true center of the building. That's why I've come from the right hand side, ensuring that the line is dark green. I'm just going to terminate that there. And now, again, if I try to model this building with two elements connected, it's going to model them all as one. So the main roofs come up nicely. However, I've now got an issue here. I can't pick this line up and try and model from there. I can't pick this line up. So something's not quite right. If I try and bring these polygons down, we get a very abrupt flatten. But let's make sure that image is flat. Let's jump into 2D. And again, I'm gonna click one line, hold control, select the lines where it's connected, split those lines into 3D. And again, now we can model this one individually. Let's bring it up again to five meters. Oh, 53 meters. Let's have a look at that while it's there. Super tall building. Five meters more sensible. Um, and let's say this is three meters, for example. So the default height for any building added is three meters indicated here. So I'll leave that where it is. Um, and then let's bring up the pitch there. Um, or indeed, again, it can meet the, the main building there, um, but we'll leave that lower. I'm going to jump back into 2D. Um, because we do have a chimney here um, that covers the ridge um, and the two ends. And we also have a dormer here to include. Um, Chris, got a question. Sorry, mate. Got a question from uh, from Dorothy, and I've noticed it as well. That uh, ridge line on that main house, should that yeah. actually be at a right angle rather than coming into the, the 4.72, 4.72? Quite possibly. Let's have a look. Probably, possibly just drawn a dodgy line. Yeah, well spotted. Let's find that again. So now I'm going to have trouble finding the midpoint here because these lines are split. So you see this end. Green line. There we go. That looks much better. Uh, well spotted. Was it Dorothy? It was, yeah, but you need to move it a bit further to the left now. <laughs> Why is that? Because you, you're you not in the middle. You're middle this side, but you're not in the middle the other side. So they, these are the same lines. So I'm perfectly in the middle here. Yeah. So th this is the middle of the overall property because that's the same length as this length. No. No? No, because the, the other side is slightly shorter. That's the middle on that side, but it's not the middle on the other side. If you just drag that line over to the left-hand side slightly. Yeah, go there and then just move your other thing over. That ah, doesn't matter. <laughs> Sorry, mate. There you go. Yeah, that's great. That's it. There you go. Um, into 3D. Right, we need to flatten that now because we've moved the ridge line. Perfect. Uh, let's bring that back up to 30. Bring this one back up. So that's 20, for example. Okay, good. Um, into 2D, we need to add our chimney here. So I'm not sure you can see this black line at the bottom. So I'm going to use this black toolbar at the top. Once again, when adding obstructions, it's very important to try and get your image as square with that bar as possible. Now it's not the easiest action. So I'm using the mouse wheel just to slightly rotate the model and trying to get an even distance across my line and the black bar. That will then mean when I plot the obstacle like so, it should plot near enough at 90 degrees. Um, we have requested um, that they allow us to 
align obstacles to ends, um, the same as module placement. Um, development are looking at that, but no word on when it may occur. Um, so that's the chimney plotted. Um, now let's look for this dormer. So it's quite difficult to see, um, but we've got a dormer here effectively. Um, so there's many different ways you can draw a dormer. Um, I'm going to do it like this, going to add one line up there for the cheek. Um, it finishes roughly around there. Add another line up that meets the other line indication from the software. I'm then going to use the center point of that to float a dark green line up and it will connect the two for me. Right, so now if I go to model and pull this up, it doesn't like it. So again, we're going to need to look at that split feature. So let's undo that into 2D and let's use this line and this line, split those back into 3D. Now, when I pull this dormer up, it snaps up into a nice dormer, which is pretty much what we wanted. Um, if you then try and maneuver this further, you'll see that it affects the main roof. You can't adjust that individually. So by undoing again, back into 2D, um, I've got a phrase and that's if in doubt, split them out. So select every line, split into 3D. We should now be able to see that we can change that individually to the main building. However, by doing that, it's gonna throw off the back of the dormer. In effect, if it was different, the line should have been longer here. So I'll put it back as it was. Um, you can, can look at other dormers. Um, we could have a flat roof dormer, for example, which is essentially a rectangle within the roof onto your 3D. And what you'll find is if you add something new, remember I said the default height for any obstacle in designer is three meters. So you can either hover above the property and double click to get the polygons, or you can whip inside the property, double click to get the polygon, and then either way you can bring up the height. So let's just use the fact I can see it there, bring up the height to meet those, and there's a flat roof dormer. Um, there are many different types of dormer. Um, indeed, we could have um, another one of these, um, but further up the roof. Um, so let's add one here. Uh, across, just very roughly modeling this. Terminate that there, use the center line, float the line up, connect the dots. Back into 3D. Same sort of exercise, double click the polygons, bring it up to the height. You can then click out and drag these down individually. Like that. Um, so these are dormers with cheeks and faces. Flat roof dormer, another dorm with, dormer with a cheek and face uh, some way up the roof. Um, what else have we got? There's one more that I can think of right now. Let's just model one quickly. So rather than having some upstands or cheeks, we could effectively just float a line across, find the center point, connect the dots, and then that will just appear ever so differently on the roof without the cheeks. Um, so again, Grab the polygon there, bring them up to the right height, bring these corners down. There we go. So one, two, three, four different types of dormer on the same elevation there. Really um, nice, Chris. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, the main point of the site was again to show you the split. Um, we have got an obstacle that we've not really dealt with here, so we can bring that chimney up. Um, and also the dormer using the split function, um, a flat roof dormer there. Um, and the split function, if you try to amend this, um, sometimes you'll find it will twist the roof. So if in doubt, split them out. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to site three unless there's any questions there, Richard. No, all good, been answering those, thank you. Lovely. Uh, webinar three. Uh, okay, commercial flat roof. Um, let's jump into site modeling. Um, so, a somewhat large, but still in comparison to others, a fairly modest size flat roof. Um, we have a parapet wall running around the outside. Um, 
The imagery is ever so slightly skewed. Um, you can indeed just see some of the wall here. So the parapet depths here seem particularly deep compared to the parapet lengths here. Um, so we'll use a, a bit of common sense and, and real world knowledge when it comes to this one. Um, again, I have checked for imagery um, on Google Earth, but um, no better imagery exists. So we'll work with what we've got. Um, let's plot the first corner and start drawing from there. So we're going to go around the outside first of all. Um, actually, now I'm going to change my mind. Let's go from the inside first of all. Just delete that line. So first corner here. Come to the end of your parapet there. Again, observing the right angles. Let's stick to the inside edge of that parapet. And I don't even need to see this section here to know I've got a right angle because I've got an upright here. If I switch to grid view, so I can draw a line there, and it's not until the line gets parallel that it will go dark green there. And because it's parallel with this line, which I know I've drawn at a right angle, as soon as it goes dark green, you get the right angle indicator here. So the point I was trying to make was I don't need to necessarily see that right angle indicator. I know as soon as that line goes dark green, that it's a 90 degree angle. Again, I can't see it. But I know it's dark green. If I zoom out, you'll see the right angle in the top right of the, the model there. Um, let's just whip around this quickly. And the software is giving me the indication there to finish. Okay, perfect. So you can see, as I've mentioned, the imagery is slightly skewed, um, but we'll work with what we've got. Okay, so we've effectively got. Um, our inside area of our flat roof. So if I jump into 3D, again, default height, three meters, um, we can see we've got a large flat roof area there. To jump back into 2D, we need to put the parapet in. So you can just start drawing a new line, um, but because it's not connected to the main model, you're not gonna get, first of all, the dark green representation, then you're also not going to get the next indication which i'll show you so we use let's say this section we're just going to float a line here let's say we've got a 450 parapet 450 mil i'm going to terminate that line now as i drag up you first of all see that it's going dark green to indicate that it's parallel but also as i get near the corner you'll see i now have a new indication here which is a 45 degree angle so if I click there and carry on, I now know that this distance is exactly the same distance as this because we're at a 45 degree. So again, if I carry on this line, ensuring it's dark green, get an indication there, very quickly allows you to build your parapet without showing too much concern, provided your lines are dark green, because that means they're parallel all the way around. And you are probably sick, I was talking about angles, 45s and 90s, um, but the geometry is super important at the end of the day. There, come up here, dark green, 45 recess, and now I should get the indication from the software, dark green is in line with the first point that I plotted. And then we can delete that original line. So we now have, now have two outlines of the building. Uh, jump into 3D. Um, it's somewhat easier to first of all, by double clicking, change the height of the inside roof. Um, so let's say this is, I don't know, 7.5 meters high. Um, we can then change the outside edge. Say it's a 500 mil high parapet, change it to eight meters. If I then zoom in, we can see all the way around the edge of the building, we have the parapet. Got a question on this, Chris. Will that now show the shading impact from the parapet wall as well? It's a very good question, that Richard. It will. Um, PV module placement um, into irradiance. We can now see, bearing in mind we're southerly direction here, sun is rising this area, coming around and setting over here. We can see and also look at the percentages of the reduction of shading. Now, if I change that parapet, um 
to something stupid, say 10 meters. It's obviously much higher now from the inside roof space. So now when I jump into PV module placement, you can quickly see visually how much more shade is being caused by that parapet and the amount of daylight or irradiance that's depleted, certainly from the, the edges here, um, creeping into some of our actual module space as well. Um, so let's move that back down to a more sensible height. Uh, what were we, 7.5 on the main roof, let's so say it's 500 mil high, so we need eight meters. Um, or even still for a bit more visibility on the shading, let's go a meter above the main roof. Okay, uh, we do have a couple of obstructions. So let's put those in. Again, let's use a nice long line, say this line, zoom in as much as we can, offer it up to this black toolbar at the top. It's actually not too bad. Just a slight tweak, slight tweak more. We'll leave it there. It's very difficult to get that absolutely on point precise. Um, let's change that there. Uh, and before I copy and paste, Let's set its parameters. Um, we'll say that is 300 mil above the roof. Lovely. We can then jump back into 2D. Press once, Control and C. Hover over the middle of the new obstruction that we want to paste, Control and V. And then when I jump into 3D, as we mentioned last week, it's kept the parameters of the object that I've just copied and pasted. I don't have to do it again. Not too much of a chore with only two skylights. However, when you've got several hundred or even 50, um, it's very time consuming to um, change them individually. Okay, um, so I know I've roughly got a 500 mil parapet. Um, I need to be at least a meter away from the outside edge. So now when I move into PV module placement and select this plane, um, let's align our modules in a southerly direction, first of all, uh, parallel with the roof. Um, let's look at some guidelines. So your guideline, it will only let you pull a guideline from the inside edge. So if our parapet say 500 mil, I think it was, we just need another 500 mil to be a meter in from the outside edge. However, that's only gonna leave 500 mil outside perimeter to get around the array, which I suggest is not enough. Everyone designs differently and everyone has different ideas. Um, I'm going to come a meter from the inside edge, and then that then leaves the ability to walk around the outside edge of the roof. Um, there's actually no plant on this roof, so that's sometimes things you need to give consideration to also. Um, but I'm going to drag that in from each inside edge. You can either drag it or type the distance you want on the point there. Um, and you don't have to click this button to get a guideline. You can just click on any edge. On meter, let's just work around and whip these in quickly. So here we can see that one meter pretty much brings us to the edge of the shaded area. Um, but for the sake of it, let's come in just that little bit more. We're up by 10% on the, on the shade in there. Um, I don't think that's going to do any harm. Um, what have we got here? There's a meter there. We've got 70%. Yeah, that's fine. This, this is a little bit more intense in terms of shading, but we're good with a meter there. Let's see how we're doing here. Yeah, a meter's fine. And then lastly, just these two edges. One meter. And a meter. Um, okay, uh, let's put this one in as well quickly. Now we're ready to add some modules. So if we go to our add PV module, um, let's go for um, any suggestions. Let's have a trainer. Uh, let's go for a 400 uh, vertex, uh, completely at random, um, black module. So we're going to look at a single tilt first of all. Um, again, you need to confirm this with your mounting manufacturers. This comes up time and time again. Um, but commonly, self tilted A frame systems or flat roof systems are tilted at 15 or 10. Um, the frame size is only going to be one high. Um, the height off the ground, you can put it in, you don't have to, um, but it's likely to be at least five centimeters off the ground. Um, your column spacing, 
is likely to be the same as what it would be on roof um, or on a pitch roof rather. And your row spacing for south facing needs to be confirmed by your mounting manufacturer. Um, but we can see around 50 centimetres um, on most modern flat row systems. Column spacing should be two, not 20. The voice from above. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's let's float a module in first of all, or a couple. Um, and then let's just click on those and check they're aligned nicely to our main edge. They can sometimes be ever so slightly on the skew. And as you start to drag them, it doesn't let you drag them in the fashion that you'd like. Um, so let's bring those across. They fit nicely there. So let's offer it across just to keep ourselves out of this shade, because if there's no need to be in the shade, we don't need to be. That sits nicely there. Um, I can see this line of modules will carry on down nicely here. So let's select this once. So if you select one panel, it selects the whole array. Click again, it will select an individual module. We can then use this feature to grab our selection and we can bring this down. I'm just scrolling with the right mouse click all the way down. Finishes nicely there. We then have a nice line that will carry across here. And we can bring those down. And much the same here. We can bring these down. One too many. One too many. Delete that. And then come across and up. We then have quite quickly, and you potentially want to delete these, but it's quite subjective. But again, we're dealing with satellite imagery. Um, we may in actual fact find we're, we're more of a distance away, or if we want to take them out, same as before, you click once, it highlights the whole array, click twice, you've got an individual module, same there. Can you just point out the back button as well, Chris, just in case they make a mistake and delete all the yeah, modules? So so if I delete all the modules by mistake, panic. But if you press this back button, this undo button here, it'll bring it all back and wash away the sins. Um, back button's really handy. Um, indeed, so is the redo button. Um, but yeah, just, just be mindful they're there um, and don't panic if you delete something or even alter it's, your model. There's, there's also quite a few questions that have come through about the shading and the impact of the shading and things like that. So um, just, just want to highlight this about the parapet wall. Uh, the colour is there for an indication. Once you actually take this through and go down to the, um, as Chris has shown you, the closer you get to the darker colour, it shows you a percentage of, of the power that's actually going to be there. If he moves away and comes into the other areas, so you can see 50, 70 percent, and it's just there as an indication straight away. OK, on the actual summary page, when this comes through and it's all strung up, it will show you in the bottom the shading impact that's going to happen on this particular array. Um, so if you rise up the, the parapet wall um, and then go back into the summary page, it will show a more impact of shading on this system. Mm. Um, the one thing as well about solar edges, as I'm sure you're aware anyway, every module, well, in a commercial, it's every two, but you're optimizing the panels to work individually. So if you do have shading caused by these obstacles in, in the main uh, uh, remit there, certainly perhaps maybe not behind the, uh, the, the, the obstacle itself, but if there is shading on one particular panel, it will only affect that performance of that one panel, not the rest of the system. So some people I know on here may know Solar Edge very well, and some people don't know Solar Edge very well, and they're looking potentially thinking, well, you, you, you're installing very close to the shade. You are, but what you're doing is you've optimized the system with Solar Edge because you're actually reducing that impact of shade on the unshaded panels. So it depends what you want to do by maximizing the roof. And I assume now, Chris, you're going to come on and show a, an east west system, are you? Correct. Um, so I've renamed the design single tilt. Perhaps you want to look at an east west system, um, typically more kilowatt peak per, per meter squared. Um, so we can simply we can either hit duplicate and that will literally duplicate everything we were seeing, but we don't really want these modules. So let's delete that. And instead of using duplicate, let's just use this plus button here that will copy the model and its properties, but not the array. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't also copy the guidelines. So once again, I'm going to delete that. 
and I'm simply going to duplicate this one to keep my guidelines. And then I'm going to delete the modules. Um, I'm then going to rename this dual tilt. And then we're going to add the same uh, module, but we're going to look at the dual tilt. And again, to be confirmed with your man mounting manufacturers, um, but dual tilt is typically lowered to 10 degrees. Um, still in landscape, um, column spacing of two centimeters. Um, your row spacing can come down potentially um, from 40, sorry, from 50 to 40, um, but you will need to confirm that with them. Depends on the mounting system. Um, also, because we're at a lower tilt, it enables us to reduce the row spacing. So once again, I'm just going to float a couple of modules in. And I'm going to check that they're in line. I can use this line here, or I can use this line here. Why? Because I know they're parallel. Why? Because I know we've drawn 90 degree angles. So if I hit that, the modules did twist slightly there. So they're now more in line here, which is good. We want the, the modules parallel to the roof edge. Um, okay, let's bring it over slightly. Um, what we can do is where we miss these the first time around, we can just highlight this selection and bring them up. Now with the east-west, you can't just select one panel and drag it across. Oh, you can, they've changed that even better. Okay, forget I said that. Um, and then we, we basically perform the same action that we did with the southerly roof, bring these down all the way through. Um, and again, with these, with either design, you may want to look at more service pathways. There may be a, a HVAC unit here that re will require annual maintenance. You may need to leave a bit more room around that. Um, it's, it's a conversation with your customers. They may have areas of the roof they've cited for future development in terms of plant. You may be asked to also avoid certain areas. Um, again, I'm just repeating the process we did with the southerly or the single tilt modules. Um, let's remove that because that's super tight. Remove both of them. Um, I'll leave this one in just for the sake of that. Um, but now if we go to entire site and scroll in, we can now see we've got our dual tilt modules all the way across the roof. Very easily done, less than a couple of minutes. And I can now compare between the two designs. Um, and indeed, if I had an inverter and strung these through, you'd then be able to compare the reports side by side. Um, just conscious of the time and we've got another site to look at. Um, any further questions before I move on, Richard? <clears throat> yeah, there's been quite a few actually. Um, one on here from Knowles um, asking about how to align and confirm at correct tilt direction. Um, this, 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 this would, um, I think I'm guessing and assuming what the question means, how to align and confirm at correct tilt location um, direction. This, so the tilt would be down to the mounting manufacturer. So if you're using a K2 system or a Van der Volk system or a custom made or anything like that, that tilt is down to them. Generally speaking, I believe that an east-west system is at 10 degrees and a south-facing system is at 15 degrees if it's ballasted. If mm. you're penetrating the roof and you're actually putting a frame together, then you can choose the angle that you want to. So that's that's how I would say with that. The distance between the rows as well, or the distance between the columns, again, this comes down to the mounting manufacturer. So this would be on their data sheet, speak to your mounting manufacturer to understand what the distances are there uh, that, that are needed for that as well. Mm. Um, uh, does the design show shading from the panels? No, it doesn't show you in the irradiance the actual um, uh, impact that potentially would be. But say, for example, you were doing a south facing roof and you had a gap of 20 centimeters rather than 40 centimeters, it won't show you on the actual irradiance. But in the design, in, sorry, in the summary report, it will show you that there is some shading impact which has been caused by the modules. Um, yeah. So it will take that into consideration for the. Um, uh, the, the the simulation. Another one as well, does the software calculate the ballast uh, based on the distance to the edge of the roof? No, it doesn't. Uh, we're not a mounting manufacturer, we're an inverter manufacturer, so we're giving you the tools to design um, and simulate the system uh, using our inverters and our power optimizers. So thanks uh, Marcus for um, Marcos, um, for uh for for your your comments on there as well with that um another one as well so i want to address this one actually so and this is a really nice nice system to show um what's your name chris can you just pop to a satellite <laughs> view please <laughs> sorry <laughs> man 
So on this question, the question is, on the shading, I have a project where the Google image of a residential plot shows trees lining the boundary, but the owner has, has just had them all cleared. Is there a way to remove the trees from a design to avoid the incorrect shading irradiances where Google image is playing catch up? So essentially the question here is, I've designed a residential house, there's trees around the property, how do I remove the trees from the design? There are none, there are no trees on your design. If Chris just spins down on 3D on this, there is no shade on this system whatsoever around it. If there are trees, there's no shade. You see how there's no shade. All of those trees have not been modeled. So there's no shade. Even though they're there on a Google Earth image, they have not been designed. There is no shade on this system other than the parapet wall. So if you were to draw trees, you're gonna see this next week anyway, but you need to draw the trees in. So in that example, Nick, there are no trees on your Google Earth image in the first place. Much like Dorothy, I believe you had this question last week as well. If, you, if you've got shading from another building as well, which could then, if there's a building where this car park is, for example, you would have to draw that building and put that mm. to the height as well. So you can then see the level of shade that's going to appear from that building. So as it stands, this system has no shade on it other than the parapet wall around the outside and obviously the obstacles in the middle. Yeah. If you were to build a, a 20 meter high building here, you'll yeah. then see the irradiance covering this roof. But until you model factors in, the software doesn't know to take them into account. So as Richard said, you're seeing trees, but as far as the software is concerned, the trees aren't there. This is yeah. just a, a base image for you to develop from. And until you add the, the features in, they won't be taken into account from the software. So it's only as good as, as the model you create effectively. Um, okay, let's jump to the next slide. Really nice examples there, Chris. East, west, south. There's a lot of comments of how, how amazing that design was. So well done. Really good. Cool. And, and the beauty of it is it is scalable very quickly. Um, all right, that, that was a modest size roof, but it makes no difference really. As fast as you can drag the mouse, you can pull the modules over. Take a little bit of time when you first plot them. Make sure that they can carry through different parts of the building and they're in line and they're aligned correctly then it's just a, really a simple case of dragging across and down and across and down and choosing which ones you want to select. Um, okay, uh, let's look at a, a ground mount system. Um, we have, uh, a fa again, a fairly modest area. Um, sorry. Um, we're going to use a draw feature uh, and we're not creating a building. Um, in this instance, we are defining the area where we want to place our modules. Uh, so let's start here. Uh, let's just mark the outline and this doesn't necessarily have to be at right angles. Um, however, um, old habits die hard and there's no reason not to plot it at right angles. Um, you can follow the line of the, of the um, land here, but what you'll find is when you try and align modules to the edge, so I'll leave that line there. If we're trying to align to this edge, really we want another line across here, but I'll show you that in a second. Um, let's bring that here. Let's just come down uh, and join out there, for example. Um, so this is our plane now, worth checking into 3D. As I've said, the default height for any model within Designer is three meters. Now, sometimes the software will recognize, uh, I'm not sure how, but it will recognize, possibly because we've got a building in here as well, it's done it at three meters. But sometimes it plots this to zero in advance, but it's always worth checking particularly if you want to use an M16 and M1600 optimizer, which is designed with ground mount in mind, which is a four to one optimizer. It will not let you use it if you do not lower the building to zero. It just will not let you use it. It will say there's an issue um, and it won't let you configure with it. So make sure your ground is at zero. So just double click your polygon, change that to zero. Okay, in effect, that's our modeling done. We can now jump straight into PV module placement. Just um, want to say at this point as well, Chris, last week there was a couple of people asking about uh, 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 ground arrays going in people's gardens and things like that. Exactly the same. This can You can do a 250 kilowatt, a two, 2.5 megawatt, or just a 2.5 kilowatt system with a ground array. Yeah. Yeah. It's, again, it's scalable. Um, it gets a little bit, um, not clunky, but slow um, the bigger you go. Um, around about five, six meg, it, it can start having to think a little bit. Um, refresh is your friend. 
Always check that this says saved after every action you perform and do not leave your site until this says saved, unless ultimately it is crashing out and you need to reset. You may lose and, the last action that you completed, but yeah, only, only when it gets that big. <laughs> yeah, only exactly. when it gets that big. Exactly. Um, okay, add a module. Um, let's use this module, that's fine. Um, so it's going to be a single tilt. Let's look at a classic ground array table. Um, we want to achieve a 30 degree tilt. Um, if you go in landscape, they're typically the tables four modules high. If you go in portrait, they're typically two high. Um, reason being is they both equal roughly the same height. Um, they are most typical tables, but it will need to be confirmed with your mounting manufacturer. Um, we'll say it's a meter off the ground. However, it does depend on the topology. If you've not got flat land and you're on a hill, um, some of them may be higher, some of them may be lower, um, or indeed they may still all be uniform. But again, that's something to check with your manufacturer. Column spacing at two, and we're gonna to look to try and avoid inter-row shading um, at five meters. However, designer will not model that inter-row shading. As Richard said, it may give you an indication or a percentage within the summary and reports, but on the irradiance feature, you will not see into row shading. And this is something that really is, again, dictated by your mounting manufacturer. But we'll work with five metres, two centimetre spacing, um, one metre off the ground, four high in landscape. Let's bring that back. Now, I'm just going to plot a couple of modules and then I'm going to set them to align with the edge just to make sure the rest that I draw, I know they're in line. So we've got four high in landscape. I can then simply drag those across. Um, the trees are there, but for the sake of the exercise, I'll just move that down. So there, for example. Um, now we know, because I've put in five meter row spacing, if I now drag this down, it plots them at five meter intervals. So between the bottom of this module to the top of this module, straight down to the ground, that would measure five meters. So I can come out of this, go to entire site, zoom in, and now I will see the modules look like they're floating. This is the meter from the ground that I've entered. It shows no racking. We've got four modules in landscape high. Um, we can click on each table. And it will tell us there's four rows there of 17 columns, um, obviously times four. Um, total site power 122.4 DC with 272 modules. So I could now take those um, and align them to this edge just by clicking the, the blue arrow or face them this way. Um, facing them this way now, I've got the issue because I haven't got that line. So if I wanted to align to that edge, they're going to align diagonally rather than horizontally here. So what I can do is let's just align them to that edge quickly. If I jump back into site modeling, I can simply introduce a new line into 2D. It can be anywhere down this point. And we're looking for it going dark green to symbolize it's parallel with this. Let's jump into grid view so you can see it easily. So I'm looking for this line to go dark green and the line I'm drawing to be dark green, which is there. You'll see them both go dark green. Simply need to bring that across parallel. As I've said, it doesn't matter where you plot the line. Jump back into module placement, satellite view. I can now click them. And I've now got a new edge I can align to because I've drawn that new line. So it serves no purpose other than that align function. So if I now delete these modules and look to add them in portrait, see this is saved now. And now, if I had them in portrait, as I've mentioned, portrait, they are too high. Um, same row spacing, because in effect, it's the same height of the table, same column spacing, same height off the ground, same tilt. And I bring that down. I can then add the same ground array in, but this time they are in portrait. Again, they look like they're floating. That's the meter off the ground that we put in. So quite quickly, you can scale that up um, for much bigger areas um, and indeed get up to five, six megawatt quite quickly. It just depends on, on what you need. Now, Richard mentioned garden arrays. Um, 
they can be A-frames. Um, there are also tub systems. Um, let's have a look at how to do that quickly. And that's, that's all down to the frame size. So rather than too high with a, a tub or a single A-frame, we're only gonna, only gonna be one high. We're not gonna be a meter off the ground. We're probably gonna be five centimeters off the ground with the height of the, the mounting structure itself. Column space is still gonna be two centimeters, but we're not gonna need a five meter row spacing. If we're single tilt, same as our flat roof we've just done, probably only need 50 centimeters and they're likely to be in landscape. Now we've entered those parameters. Let's click an edge to align to before we start plotting modules. Let's float some in. Let's click them, check they're also aligned. And they're much the same as the flat roof. I mean, we're talking a garden, so it'd probably be a, a modest size. Um, much the same as the flat roof, we can leave those there. And there's your, your smaller system. And again, you can change their orientation. I mean, this is normally, you probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, but you can spin them around and face them in whichever direction you want. Or if they wanted to cover the whole area, using that, that ground system that you'd use on a flat roof, you can also do that much the same as before. Just drag the area into entire site and you can see you've got, got a field of tiny little A-frame system or tub systems there. And again, change, change the tilt, change the angles um, to match the system that you're using. And this will give you an indication. Um, you can then take this, go to your, your racking manufacturer, this is the layout I want to achieve. I've used these parameters. Um, they'll come back and say, yep, you can do that. Or no, you need to change your row spacings. Um, or no, our tables don't come in that configuration. Um, so for the larger ground arrays, you probably want to chat to your mounting manufacturer before you put a design down on the table. It's a design that they will have to reproduce anyway, because they'll need to check your inter row spacing. Um, and depending on your technique, whether you're pile driving um, or even cementing in, um, the foundations for the tables. Um, but yeah, that, that is a ground array. Wonderful, Chris. Just shows how easy it is to do over a roof mount, a flat roof, a residential, a ground array. They're all, they're all, they're all really good. So um, I'm just going through the questions now. I've answered pretty much all of them, but I remember from earlier, there was one that I wanted to read out. Um, just in this interim, if there are any other questions you've got, then please jot them down now. Um, how to separate the roofs. Uh, our financial section, um, will that be discussed today? No, that's coming next week. Um, next week, we're actually doing a, a barreled roof or a cow zip roof, a curved roof. Um, for anyone that knows what one of those is, um, we get often request that from commercial clients. Uh, we're also doing a, a carport next week as well. Uh, we'll be going over some inverter selection and stringing, um, some tips and tricks on that as well. Uh, we're also going to be going through the trees. Uh, next week, so shading happens from the from the trees. Uh, we're also going to be going through the financial analysis as well, which is one of the tabs that we still haven't covered um, so far on that. So we will be going through that. Um, oh, where was this question? Um, oh, okay. Um, no, that wasn't it. Oh, Jordan, it was your question. Uh, would you choose east, west, or south till? So. I've answered this question to Jordan, who's basically said, following on from that previous design about the south or the, the east-west. So personally, it, it, it's 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 it, there's two people involved in this. There's you as the installer and there's the end user. So it's going to be one of you that has that decision. So what I personally would do is actually provide both of the designs to the customer. That's what I personally would do and say, look, this is an east-west system and this is a south system. This one generates X amount, this one generates X amount. This one costs X amount, this one costs X amount. The, re the reason why I'd say that is because everyone's installing solar for different reasons. Some people are just um, installing it to tick a box, um, no comment. Uh, some people are actually doing it to look at the viability and the future of everything with you know, energy storage, with EV charging, and with maximizing what they want to generate from their roof available. And, some people are doing it down to the DNO. It, it's lots of different reasons. So personally, I would give both of the options to show if we did this in East-West system, we can get 600 modules. If we did it in a south facing region, we can get 400 modules, something like that. It's really, really straightforward to duplicate the design as Chris is showing you. It's 
really easy to do the, uh, the, the the layout and everything. And then it's very easy as well to then actually then just print both of those designs off. And then essentially your customer is going to decide. One thing you're obviously quite aware about is if you're doing an east-west system, it could actually reduce the amount of ballast that you're going to be using compared to a south-facing uh, roof. Um, so maybe that's an option. Maybe that actually reduces the price in some way by actually having more modules. Um, it could be the more you buy, the cheaper the system is. Um, generally speaking as well, if you've got a south-facing roof, as I've just mentioned, with 400 modules, sorry, 600 modules, no, 400 modules, and then perhaps an east-west system of, say, 600 modules, you're getting more modules on there. When are you generating power? You're now going to be generating power you know, throughout the whole day rather than just an actual peak uh, during the day. But then again, it comes down to the angles if it's 10 degrees or 15 degrees. So th there's different options. But to answer that question, I personally would say give the choice to the end customer. Um, yeah, so that's that. Yeah. Um, got, I've got um, one more question that's come through as well, Chris. So I'll let um, you carry on. And it's basically saying I've got a meeting next Friday. Can you send me the can you send me the expert training to me? Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you can quickly see uh, east-west in the same area, 502 modules, single tilt, 435. Um, so it's a bit of a no-brainer in terms of energy production, 179.3 megawatt hours on the dual tilt, 156.38 on the single tilt. Why? Because it's more DC. Um, it also enabled us to select a slightly higher inverter even though the oversizing is around the same, 111 and 114. Um, and it goes back to what Richard was saying. East-West will give you a more even generation throughout the day. Um, south will obviously, or a single tilt will obviously still give you generation throughout the day, but you will experience more of a spike um, around the midday. And it's it's not one rule for all because it depends on the location, it depends on the shading patterns, it depends on the time of year. If it's east west, then you're likely not to generate as much power in the winter compared to the southerly aspect in the in, in the summer. Uh, sorry, in the winter. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, I mean, I would imagine that an east west system on 10 degree pitch versus a 15 degree pitch south facing, you're actually going to generate more power in the summer from an east west facing roof at 10 yeah. degrees because the sun's much higher in the sky. But if you're talking yeah. about being in Cornwall or you talk about being in Scotland, it's two different things as well. So it's it's quite variable um, on 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 those situations. So. Cool. Great. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Once again, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I'm sorry we've got over 20 minutes again, um, <laughs> but yeah, everyone's still here. So thanks very much for your attendance today, guys. Um, and yeah, any feedback, anything you've got afterwards, please let us know. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye.